Yo, what's good, YouTube? This is Jay from TNJ, and welcome to the season one finale here in the Nashville Stars franchise. You know, this year has been actually quite surprising. I think we've done way better than what we thought we would have done this season. And, you know, now we start to look at the future. This episode, I really want to focus on the players themselves and who we're looking at going into the offseason. And with that being said, I want you guys to get yourselves involved in the series. Submit your recruit down below in the comment section. I left a template for you guys to follow. And how I will do this is that I will rename every non first round draft pick to one of you guys randomly. And then for the first round for other teams, I will rename them to you guys as well. So there will be roughly around 30 uh subscribers slash uh people who comment who make this series and they will all be first rounders i also will like boost their attributes just a bit to accelerate them to the show because a lot of times in the show it takes like seven years six years for first round picks to get up there so i definitely want to accelerate that to make it more of like three years or something like that even two maybe one in certain cases so I want to focus on the players in this episode and really start to evaluate what we're going to do here in the offseason. I love the offseason in MLB The Show. It's pretty lengthy, but I like the excitement of it and just seeing the drama of it. And one guy I first want to look at is Jesus Aguilar. Now, going into the offseason, what I'm going to do, I said $50 million for a budget. I'm going to set it at 60. 60 would land us in a bottom six budget in the MLB as far as averages go. I believe it will land us right at six for the lowest budget. So I like that. I like having that challenge. 50, I think, is too much of a restriction. So I want to go into the offseason at least having some flexibility. Jesus Aguilar is demanding about a two-year, about 14 or so million dollar contract, So which will land him about $6 million a year, $7 million sometimes if we want to give him a boost there and to ensure that he will resign with us. But he's a guy I'm definitely looking at, and he is the number three or four bat in our lineup. I'm not sure if I want to pay for that at age 32. But the next guy I'm really, really impressed with, who we don't have to worry about his contract going into the offseason, is Elizar Hernandez. I think that he could be better than Chris Paddock. He's 10-7. and seven. He has a better whip than uh, Paddock. He has a better ERA than Paddock. And he's a very good pitcher. Here we are taking a look at him at home. Now, there's a weird glitch in MLB The Show, so we will just pretend there's like a snow day in Nashville as this is the custom stadium glitch here where you have to kind of go in and reassign the stadium and everything, go to edit the stadium and make sure everything's good. So right now the field looks white. But here he's playing the Pittsburgh Pirates who are not competing for a uh, playoff spot now, but we'll see what he can do versus them. Here is a fly ball to right, a right field. Taylor Trammell playing a right field runs that one down. Brian Hayes comes up with one out, and Elizar gets him to swing and miss at an outside slider for the second out of the game. Two outs in this inning, and that brings up Daniel Vogelback, who does swing and miss at some high heat, and Elizar gets out of that first inning, no damage done. On to the second inning, more swinging and missing here for the Pirates. On to the third inning, Elizar still dealing so far. No runs by either team, but a ground ball to short. Good throw on the first base. And that will bring up Greg Allen here as the top of the lineup comes back to the plate. And a ground ball here to Michael Rock. And it will be a out there in the third. Cabrian Hayes back for his second at bat. He swings and misses again for his second strikeout of the game. Elizar has been really, really impressive so far. Vogel back, back to the plate. Another swing and miss. The three and four hitters both strike out twice in this one. Elizar showing his potential as a... Not an ace, but a really top of the rotation starter that I can really depend on as we move on to the fifth inning. Now he's playing with the two nothing lead. Here's a deep fly ball. Victor Robles giving chase and he camps under that one. No runs given up through five and two quarters innings and that one will be the third strikeout or the third strike of that at bat. He's officially through five innings. I meant four and two thirds onto the sixth inning. Now that brings up a batter lead off the six, a shot to left center field. This one will not get over the wall, but Sawinski will have the ground rule double right there. Now a man on second base that brings up Roberto Perez to the plate. 
Ground ball to first. Aguilar throws on. And that one will be an out at first base, bringing up the top of the order again. Greg Allen to the plate. This time he gets a hold of one. Robles giving chase, and this one will get over his head. The second ground roll double of the inning. And Pittsburgh is on the board as we allow Elizar to continue this inning here. And he gives up another shot deep to right field. And that one will score the second run of the inning. It's now a 5-2 game. We will see if Hernandez can pitch out of this one. He's at about his 89th pitch of the game, facing Vogel back again. And a favorable call on the circle change will get us out of that inning. Vogelback goes down. We end up winning that game after Elizar pitched that those full six innings there, giving up two runs, striking out seven, giving up four hits. But I'm very, very impressed by Hernandez. He's a guy I definitely want to keep around for the long term. Now let's talk about a guy that I really thought coming into the series would be kind of a cornerstone piece. And early on, I thought it was pretty much the same Victor Robles. Hit 222 years ago, 203 last season, but he has really come around as of late. Hitting about 275, we've moved him up in the batting order going into the month of August and September. And at 54 and 62, we are competitive with him at that leadoff spot. You can just see right here, we are actually doing pretty well since the trade deadline. So here is Robles here at home. Like I said, hitting about 275, facing the Toronto Blue Jays. His first at bat will be a shot to left field. Actually, that's his second at bat here in the second inning. And he does get a hit here at off of Alec Manoa. And he's one for two in this one. Here an outside pitch. He has decent power at 49 power versus right. That's actually pretty good for a center fielder which doesn't have a lot of pop to his bat but he's more of a defensive guy but his offense is now starting to come around here in the sixth inning he pops up here to Biggio at second base as now we go on the road and face Toronto at Toronto and he gets a hit up the middle now if he can contribute like this going into next year at the top of our lineup I think he could be you know, vying for that top leadoff spot. We do have a couple of leadoff batters who I think can be good guys there at the number one spot in our lineup. I think Robles is one of them, and I'm excited to see his bat kind of follow his glove. And hopefully he can, you know, continue to get better in that category. The next guy I want to look at is Taylor Trammell. We all know about the power, 87 power versus right-hander. He is under cost control for the next four seasons. If you just look here, 700,000, he's going to make 700,000 next three years. I mean, that is excellent, excellent, favorable to excellent and favorable. What am I saying? Excellent and favorable to the organization. And he has the home run power, as you can see right here versus Pittsburgh. But the thing with Trammell is, is that, you know, he's going to hit some homers. But with timing hitting, it's tough to really get a good average with him I, I, he's got low contact he's got low vision he's got the power we all know about it he's gonna swing and miss a lot joey gallo-esque but i say worse than gallo because at least gallo when he does get a hold of a pitch it's gonna be a very far hit ball but for Tramel, it's once in a while he's gonna pop out a lot he's gonna strike out a lot He's going to be in the low 250s as far as on base percentage, but he is going to hit bombs once in a while, like you see here, going to opposite field back at Music City Field. But he's not going to foul off a lot of pitches, so if we do swing at some pitches out of the zone like that one, it's not going to be a foul tip or anything. And then pitches right over the middle, he's going to miss like that and then have to swing at a strike nonetheless, but a worse strike. He's going to fly out to center field just like that. You know, Tramiel is interesting. I do like him, and I didn't trade too much for him, so I do like his potential. Let's move on to the other guy we acquired from the Padres, ha Song Kim coming over, backing up uh, Fernando Tatis. Now, he has actually a larger contract at $7 million per year. We're going to have to find a way to justify that. If he can hit the ball well, it will be a good sign, but he's got to hit the ball well. I mean, I, I can't keep a guy around just because he's good defensively because there's other guys that are in the middle infield that can also hit well. I'm thinking of John Dumont, who is one of our top prospects right now. 
And also think now Justin Faith, another one of our top shortstop prospects. And then we have Rojas, obviously, who's under contract for the next two years. But then there's other guys like Michael Rock, a guy that I moved up just to replace Miguel Rojas in the meantime while he recovered from an injury. Deep potential 66 overall, but he's hitting over 300 in 50 something at bats. It's just like very, very interesting. 55 at bats, 18 hits. Could he be just one of those guys that, you know, you just have in the show that performs way better than his ratings? I'm not sure. I'm going to bump his potential up to a C because I don't think it's realistic that, you know, a guy has a deep potential and he made it to the majors. I just don't think that's realistic. 7.7 .7 runs created through 55 at bats is very, very impressive, especially for a guy that's never had MLB experience. So we want to check him out on the road. I just want to give you a look at what he looks like. He's on a nine game hitting streak facing the Houston Astros on the road, hitting 327 facing Jake Odorizzi. He gets a pitch up in the zone. He gets enough wood on this one. Will it get down? But it does not in center field. He does not have a lot of power, but his contact ratings are really, really good. And he will be under cost control for a while. He's a very, very cheap depth utility guy. He gets enough wood on this one to go to left center. That one drops down. We will send the runner from third. The throw will be home in time. But the tag was not put down on the runner coming around the catcher's glove. And that one will be a nice hit to left center by Michael Rock. Like I said, he doesn't have that great power, but he is an awesome depth guy that we've just discovered all of a sudden. And it looks like he could be a pretty big contributor on the MLB level in the future. Here he gets a pitch up in the zone, and that one was hung up there. If that was anybody with power, that would have been gone. With 24 power, that made it about 280 feet or so. <laughs> Fly out to left field. Nashville ends up winning this one on the road. Six to five with Robert Suzuki getting the win in this one. Fuentes went three for five as well. Speaking of Suzuki, he is one of those interesting prospects that we moved up about halfway through the season. He has actually been untouchable through 11 innings pitched. He is our closing pitcher. We kind of moved him into that role. Zero earned runs, six hits, one home run given up. He's an interesting guy. He does throw a kind of submarine type of uh, uh, pitching motion there. I will kind of change that to a sidearm. I don't think it's realistic for a submarine guy to throw in the upper 90s. I don't. I can't think of any submarine guys that have thrown upper 90s with their fastball, to be honest with you. But I'm going to change his uh, pitching motion to more of a sidearm action and make that more realistic. But as a lefty closer, he kind of reminds me of Josh Hader a little bit. Not as good, obviously. But still, a guy that has a lot of potential as a closer. You can just see here facing the Indians, facing Josh Naylor here, throwing him quite a few pitches. Gets this one to a three and two count with one out. And then nails the corner. Strike three on the sinker. And with the chance to get the save, that brings in Brian Rocchio to the plate. And that one will be some high heat, 98 mile an hour on the gun. Swing and miss, another save. And he preserves that zero earn run in here in his rookie season. And he will not be considered for the rookie uh, of the year award, I don't think, this year, based on just the amount of games he's played. And I think next year he will be eligible. But looking at the month of August, we actually don't do too bad, to be honest with you. And it could obviously be worse. And I believe our record in the month of August was 13 and 14. So a pretty good month there. I think that, you know, that's something to kind of build on. And I am excited to see, you know, what these young guys can do, especially these 20 year olds like Suzuki and John Dumont. He's coming up in the organization pretty quickly. I thought about moving him up to double A, but now that we're, I mean, triple A, but now that we're in the September call-ups uh, phase of this season, I'm going to move him to the show. So he will get a shot at the show right away. Skipping triple A, he will make his debut. He is our number three prospect right now in the organization behind uh, Kerry Doss, the first baseman, the big hitting first baseman. And Tyson King, the third baseman behind Josh Fuentes right now, who will also get his shot at the show. Here's his first at-bat facing Frankie Montas on the mound. 
A pitch over the middle, a little bit late on that one. 2-2 two, two pitch now is on. He watches that one for ball three. He does get on base at a high clip at double A, but the 3-2 fastball will get blown past him for strike three. 0 for 1 today. Nashville does have the one nothing lead. This is a weak ground ball to short, and he now gets his second out of the game. 0 for 2 at the plate today for facing Montas. Now we have the 3 nothing lead in this game, and that one is a good pitch over the middle for him to hit, but he just gets under it. 0 for 3 start to his career. We will not hit him too much here in the month of September, but I just at least want to get his feet wet with MLB pitching, and he ends up going 0 for 4 in his debut. Nonetheless, Nashville does get the win in this one, 3 to 1. Chris Paddock gets another win, eight strikeouts, no earned runs. We only gave up a run here in the eighth inning, but it's good to see a couple of guys getting their shot at the show. Tyson King was struggling at AAA, actually. We move him up. When he was hitting below 200, and we had him at the double-A level, he led double-A in home runs this year with 21. Moved him up to triple-A on your guys' recommendation. You said the higher the level, the faster they progress. So I moved him up there. He only hit 183, as you can see, OPS at 600 pretty much. And I'm going to give him a shot at the show, see what he's got here in the tank. And if he faces Patrick Corbin for his debut here at the MLB level with the Nashville Stars, the lefty inside slider brings it to a 3-2 count. And with the man on first base, that one will be fouled off. Let's do that 3-2 again now. The pitch outside corner a little too early on that one. And a hard ground ball to third base, and it will be the third out of the inning in his first at-bat. Second at bat now facing Corbin. He gets a pitch to hit, and that one is a dinger to left field. That one will be a single, and I love that. Getting some wood on it, even if you were a little early on an outside pitch, it's good enough to get a base hit. I think Tyson King's got the potential to be very, very good in this lineup. He's going to have a chance to compete in spring training for that starting third base spot. He's going to be competing with Josh Fuentes. I think I'm going to bring it down to you know, spring training and that competition. Here he gets a pitch to hit right over the middle, and he just misses. That would have been exciting to hit a home run there in his debut. One for three today. Will Harris now on the mound for the Nationals. Ground ball to first. This one will be to Tyson King with a one for four debut here at the MLB level. But I like what I see from King. At least I can see that, you know, he hits the ball solidly. John Dumont didn't have... Uh, a very good debut. He had a couple of weak ground balls. At least I saw some hard hit balls from uh, Tyson King. But I think that's going to wrap up our season here. As we go through the month of September, we end up finishing the month of September 11 and 15. We went 13 and 14 in August and then went 0 and 2 in October and finished 72 and 90. Actually, not bad to be honest with you. With an expansion team, I thought we were going to be like a 50 win team. The Royals finished worse than us. The Athletics finished worse, worse than us. So right now we have the third worst record in the AL, as you can see. We are behind the Twins, who only won one more game than us, and so did the Rangers. They only won 73 games, so the third worst in the AL. The Nationals lose more games than us. The Pirates lose more games than us. And the Diamondbacks also lose more games than us. So we had five teams that were worse than than us here in the inaugural season in Nashville. So I would say that's actually kind of a success. I thought we would be maybe the worst, if not the second or third worst. We're actually the sixth worst. I mean, that's not bad. Looking at the statistics at the end of the year, how about Tyson King, though? I think he's just ready, man. I can't wait to see him in spring training. He hit 333 and is limited at bats. Pretty awesome to see, even though it was limited. Victor Robles was just super, super impressive. I'm happy to see him just bounce back from a couple of bad years. And to be the full-time center fielder, not have an injury or anything like that, didn't miss really any games. He hit 260. I mean, that's not bad. $1.3 million is his contract right now. I am worried about that a little bit because we're eventually going to have to extend him. But he's going into an arbitration year this year and then the following year. Then that following year, he will be a free agent. So... I think either committing to him long-term is the key 
maybe not this offseason, but next offseason, or finding a center fielder of the future who will be under cost control. Michael Rock ended up dipping down a little bit to 254, kind of expected with just his overall, but I thought he would he was really overachieving getting over 300. It was impressive. Josh Fuentes was the starting third baseman the entire year. Now, getting on base has never been his thing, but he hit 251. $1.5 million contract. I'm definitely renewing that. That's not bad for me, especially since our team budget is $60 million coming into this offseason. At least the player uh, budget is $60 million. I think one point five is fine for Josh Fuentes. I think he's a good bat in our lineup. If he doesn't start at third, I think he can start at first. I, I don't think there's a limitation there. Jesus Aguilar is the biggest question mark. Like I said, he's demanding about six to seven million dollars a year. He makes eight right now. I'm just not sure at age 31 if I want to bring him back. And I'm not sure. Let me know down in the comment section what you guys think I should do. But I also want to use a lot of our budget to go after at least a, uh, I would say a tier two starting pitcher. We probably won't have the budget to go after a tier one. But at least a guy that is a good starting pitcher, we need to add to that rotation. I think the rotation is bad right now. Definitely need to improve on that. Jorge Alfaro was impressive for the first half. I think towards the second half, he definitely started to regress a little bit. Hit 246 on base percentage, went down below 300, which I was hoping would stay above 300. He was our lone all-star. Still has that 99 arm. I'm definitely still counting on him in the future. He is definitely our starting catcher. Nottingham backing him up. Maybe one of the big, biggest disappointments this year was Dominic Smith. He's a first baseman. I'm going to change that position over to first base in the offseason. I think the Mets moved him to left field because they had somebody already at first base. But 238 average, 22 home runs. Not super impressive here. And wasn't a guy I could really rely on who I thought coming into this series would be the number three bat in our lineup. I had that expectation kind of for him and Tyrone Taylor. I thought both of those guys would excel. But we shipped off uh, Tyrone and then kept Dominic Smith. I'm still gonna, probably going to keep him around, but we'll see like, you know, where he goes from here. Eric Sogard was a decent utility guy, but I'm not interested in bringing him back at age 37. Jacob Nottingham at age 26 is still decent. Like This isn't a great backup catcher, but it isn't a bad backup catcher. He hit 228, which is very, very low. But, I mean, what do you expect from a backup catcher, to be honest with you? He is 77 overall. He is $700,000 due next year. So I think that contract is okay. Like, I don't, I'm not mad at that for less than a million dollars. I mean, you pay for what you get for with him. Man, Miguel Rojas hit 228. I did not expect this. I think it was because he came off of injury, just wasn't the same. I, I expect a bigger bounce back year next year. If we get that average up to 270, I'll be happy with Rojas. He's got one more year left on his deal. And then he's kind of, you know, we might let him hit free agency. We'll see. Eli White was the utility outfielder and kind of utility player, to be honest. He plays every single position, but we mostly played him in the outfield. He's got excellent speed with 98, 99 speed, and he's just the guy on the roster. Oscar Mercado, I was kind of disappointed with because I thought that, you know, he would be kind of maybe the leadoff guy in this series, and I don't think he's that guy. I just don't. He kind of hits at the bottom of the lineup, and that's kind of what he's going to be. I... I can't lie i don't think his ceiling is very very high despite him having good attributes the production on the field doesn't match those attributes but ha song kim since we did acquire him via trade i'm going to give him every opportunity to excel and seeing that he's hitting 187 in his uh half year with the team do 14 million dollars over two years after this season interesting because that's a lot of money but that's starter money. So I don't know if I'm going to get somebody to replace him, but we'll see what happens. I might end up putting him on the trade block just because he might be a little too expensive going into the future. Then there's Taylor Trammell, obviously. He's a very, very cheap option. So I'm not truly worried about Taylor Trammell. If it doesn't work out with him, it doesn't work out. But I can always have him in the minors and just have him keep progressing. He's going to keep getting better. He's only 24 years old. So I'm not really too worried. And then John Dumont, I'm guessing is going to be our shortstop of the future. I'm going to give him every opportunity to compete to make the roster next year, but we'll have to see. 
our rotation was i mean we had two good rotate uh starting pitchers to be honest with you Elise hernandez was one of them he was our best 17 quality starts one two four whip and then chris paddock was supposed to be our ace i'm thinking that Elizar might be our ace coming into next year i don't know who's going to be the opening day starter if those two are the best two pitchers on the roster i don't know i like Elizar. like he does not disappoint me right now i like what he does Brett uh, Anderson is an older pitcher, but we did sign him in free agency when we started this series to a two-year deal, so we do still have him on the payroll. I might look to offload him. Maybe a contender wants him as just a bullpen arm. We'll see. But the bottom two starters in our rotation are definitely not returning. I think they're both due arbitration. Jamie Badia is the first one. 11 quality starts, 1-4-0 whip, which is below average. These aren't terrible numbers. But definitely not like not numbers I'm interested in keeping around. Jake Woodford as well, two set two and seventeen record. I mean, <laughs> that kind of speaks for itself. Like, I know a pitcher can't get wins by himself, but I think that kind of just speaks to what kind of pitcher he is. Nine quality starts and lost seventeen games. I mean, that is just not good. He gave up 179 hits, 88 earned runs, struck out 97, walked 62. And had a 0.8 war, which I'm actually impressed with. I thought it would be a negative war. Going into our bullpen, I love Cody Stajic. I think this is a guy, Stajak, I need to learn how to say his name. This is a guy that I think I'm going to keep around for the remainder of the series in the bullpen. You always have those guys and you love those guys that you keep around. 27 years old. Look at the numbers, though. 0.95 whip. His fielding independent pitching isn't the greatest, but he's a very good pitcher. Like he's tough to get a bat on the ball against. Yes, Miro Petit actually was our second best pitcher in our bullpen. 106 whip, 352 ERA. I'll sign up for that any day of the week, but he is 37. Phil Maton was decent, along with Piams. Both those guys were decent. And then there's Luke Jackson, who will hit free agency. I'm glad to see that money come off the books. That's $3.8 million that we can possibly use for Jesus Aguilar or another free agent coming in. So I will definitely be using that. I won't use it towards a bullpen guy because I think that our bullpen is decent. Like, we don't need to break the, break the bank on any of our bullpen on, on improving that. So I think that, you know, the guys that we have returning, they're pretty good. Like, I don't I don't feel the need to go out and resign another re, or at least not resign, but bring in and signing another relief pitcher. Surprisingly, Jesus Aguilar wins the gold glove award at first base. That will only drive up his price tag. Now, realistically, if a player wins an award, his salary demand is going to go up. I'm pretty sure that's not in the uh, programming and the coding in this game. I'm going to treat it as such, so I'm going to make his uh, annual salary that he demands from us go up $2 million. I think that's a good point there because, obviously, gold gloves are worth a lot of money. Looking at the rest of the AL, uh, Luis Arias won the batting title. Anybody who plays MLB The Show knows how good Arias is, especially on your team when you're controlling him. I mean, he is just one of those, not glitches, but one of those guys that just always performs well in the show. Mike Trout ends up winning the Hank Aaron Award in the AL, hitting 34 home runs, hitting over 300. I mean, are you really surprised there? And looking at the gold gloves here, we didn't have anybody else that finished in the top three in any other fielding position. Buxton won it in center. Randy Arozarena also won it. And now looking at the silver sluggers, Vlad Guerrero won it for first base. Javier Baez won it at shortstop for Detroit with his first year there. And then Abdubal Herrera won it in center field. And then Brian Reynolds, who got traded to the Yankees, wins it in right field for the Yanks. And looking at the NL, you can just go through the awards here. Pause if you want to see them. But, you know, I am interested in a lot of guys um, that are going into free agency. I think there are some – there is a good crop of players. So, like I said, $60 million. It's not a ton to work with. After uh, kind of going through our current contracts, arbitration, and renewals, I'm guessing we will have about $20 million to play with to go and acquire somebody new or, or re-sign whoever it is, Jesus Aguilar, whoever we want to bring in, whatever the case may be. So that's going to do it here in Season 1. Make sure you guys get your submissions in below. 
I have the template in the pinned comment. Make sure you guys get those in. Like I said, it's going to be a roughly 30 to 35 of you guys will make the series. And then every year, like that, that's how it will work. I will rename our non first round picks. Our first round picks name will remain the same. I like that in the game. Every game I play, I kind of like that. If we sign like a top pick or whatever, I like keeping the name the same, then renaming everybody else. And then you guys will be renamed to the first round picks for the other uh, 30 team or 29, I guess, teams for their picks as well. So hit subscribe, hit that like button. I appreciate you guys rocking with me for season one. Can't wait for the off season. Let me know who you guys think I should really resign or let go. I, I like a lot of these guys. I think Jesus Aguilar is the biggest question mark. We'll have to see, but stay tuned. Let's get it. Let's go.